All right. Good morning. Good to see all of you. Good to be here. If you don't, um, some of you don't know me, I don't think. Uh, my name's Tyler. I am um, Tyler. Uh, <laughs> I uh, was raised in this church and then um, was taught here a lot. And then, let me get this situated. Then last year I was the associate pastor, but then things changed a little bit for my wife and I, my wife Savannah. We had a son. And as a result of that and wanting Savannah to stay home with him, I um, started working as an engineer in Stockton. So that's what I've been doing since May. Um, the last time I preached was April and I stood here, but there was no one in this building. It was just recorded. So i um, glad to be here and glad to, that there's actually people here to me, for me to speak to. So with that, let's turn to Romans chapter eight. Our focus will be on verse 28, but I want us to read the whole chapter, which there's a little bit of danger in doing that just because it's so long. But it's also the the truth is that it's God's word, which is inspired. It's God's word, which has which can impact our lives, not what I say. What I say will be impactful only to the extent that it matches up with God's word, that it's depending upon God's word. So I want us to actually read the whole chapter because we're only going to be focusing on part of one verse. So we'll start in verse one, read through verse 39, and then the focus will be upon 28. Before we read it, though, let's pray together and ask God to help us. Father, we thank you so much for your word, which is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Your law is perfect, reviving the soul. Your testimony is sure, making wise the simple. Your precepts are right, rejoicing the heart. Your commandments are pure, enlightening the eyes. And we ask that you would open our eyes to behold the wonderful things found in your word that you would change us by your spirit so that you would be glorified in us. And we ask it in Jesus's name, amen. So Romans eight, starting in verse one, Paul's gonna start this verse with therefore, showing that it's the continuation of what he's been saying thus far in Romans. In Romans, he speaks about how all of us have sinned, all of us are under God's condemnation, but he's given us free salvation in his son. He gives us this free gift of salvation to all who will receive it. And then he's given us his spirit, like what John was talking about, who transforms us, who helps us to die to sin so that we might live to righteousness. And as a result of all that and more, now is what he's going to be talking about here. So eight, chapter eight, verse one, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. 
If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait for the as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for what for who hopes for what he already has. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what what to pray for as we ought. But the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I know. I'm ready to go home now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but I'm going to speak, so, but yeah, I'm just excited. All right, so the focus is on verse 28, which likely, if you've been around the church for any period of time, you will have heard this verse, perhaps memorized it, perhaps taught on it, perhaps even declared it to be your life verse. So when... I say I'm going to preach on Romans 8.28. There can be a tendency for us to say, really? 
Are you kidding me? Let's let's do something different. Let's do something new. We might even be in a in a wana. I was teaching on uh, Jesus walking on the water, and just as I started telling about the story, this little boy yelled out, "I know that." <laughs> and so there may be some here today because we're adults. We don't yell out in the in the crowd, but maybe we're thinking, "I already know that. I already know Romans eight twenty eight. Let's let's have something I don't know." But as we'll see, we can know this verse and yet not really know it. See, Paul says, and we know. But I want us just, before we look at what actually, what it is that we know, I want us to think about in what way do we know this? Because the first thing we need to know about how we know it is that it's not just some information we have, but it's when transformation begins to take place in our life. Or the way we usually say this is that we can know this in our head without what? (coughs) Yeah, knowing it in our hearts. Maybe it's not quite as common. (laughs) But yeah, we can know this in our head, but not know it in our heart, which means what? We can have this intellectual understanding that God works all things together for good, and yet when we're in a trial, when we're in a difficulty, we show that we don't really know this verse because anxiety and anger and bitterness and grumbling and fear begin to well up in our heart. All of those things show that though we can recite this verse, though we say we know it, we don't really know it as we could or as we should. So when we say we know this, we're saying, I want it not just to inform me, I want it to transform me. I want it where I don't just know it in my head, but I'm truly living it out in my life. So the the test we can use to know whether we know this is not whether we're able to recite it, but whether we're able to live it. Do we live Romans 8.28? In In the midst of trials, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of our life not going as we think we should, Are we able, even maybe in the midst of tears, to have this rock-solid assurance, though I feel like my life is falling apart, I know this. I know God is working all things together for my good. So whether you've memorized this, heard this, taught this, we all still need to hear this. And there's a danger for me to stand up here and preach on this verse because then it can give the perception that I got it all together. But the truth is that the majority of what I'm going to be telling, well, I should say all of what I'm going to be telling you, I've been telling myself this whole week and the past three months. So it's something that this is what God's telling us. He's just using me to convey it to you, but it's something he's been teaching me as well. So we all need to hear this, regardless of how many times we've heard it, because we want it not just to inform us, but to transform us. What else about knowing? This knowing is not something that we have by sight, but it's something we have by faith. How do we know this is true? Not because we experience that it's true in the midst of difficulties, but because by faith we accept that it's true. We don't experience when horrible things are happening to us in life that good is going to come. Because all we can see, all we can feel is there ain't no good coming of this. Everything's falling apart. My life is over. The end has come. Darkness has descended and life will never return. That's what we experience. But what God has told us is what? Despite what we see, despite what we feel, this is what's happening. All things are working together for good. But that is not something, again, that we can learn through our senses. It's something that we have to accept by faith. What I mean, what did pastor talk about what, with the shield of faith? What is faith? Faith is trusting God. So in the midst of trials, we have to ask ourselves this question. Are we going to trust what God has said 
Or are we going to trust what we feel and what we see? We have to decide. And what we need to know is that God is absolutely trustworthy. The most rational thing we can do is to trust God because he never lies. His his word always proves true. Our feelings, our senses have a horrible record of being unreliable. Because we can feel something, we can sense something that later we come to realize, oh, no, that wasn't the case. But with God, that never happens. He's always true. He's always reliable. So when we say we have this by faith, we're saying we're, we're trusting God who's told us that this is true. Faith doesn't mean, as we often hear in the culture, this blind, irrational leap. That's not what faith is. Faith isn't irrationality versus rationality. Faith is, are you going to trust what God has said or are you going to trust something else? And the most rational thing we can do is to trust God who never lies. So this this knowing is something that transforms us, something that's impacting our heart. It's something that we have by faith, not by sight. And it's also something for which we must fight, not something into which we can coast. Because we are people who are prone to trust what we feel who are prone to trust our senses. And they can seem so real in God's word, so foreign. And so if we are going to know this verse, we're going to have to fight to know it. We're going to have to do the armor. We're going to have to take up the armor of God. So often, I mean, it's almost like it's designed this way in a sense because we come to church and what do we do? We sit in this nice, comfortable chair, and it's like we're watching the TV, right? Like I've said before, the only problem is you can't turn the channel when you come here if you don't like it. You just have to deal with it. But it's, it's comfortable, and that's what we want Christianity to be. Comfortable Christianity. But what is the armor depicting Christianity as? A fight, a battle, a war. And for those of you who are in the military, think about how different the church setting is to how the military is. If we were to to hear and do the types of things that often takes place in churches or in our own personal walk with the Lord, if we were to do that um, in boot camp, it would not go over well. You know, we wake up in the morning and we tell our sergeant, you know, sir, I just don't feel like it today. You know, I don't feel like reading my Bible. I just don't feel like going to church. What would he do? Yeah, it wouldn't be a pretty sight. So, but that's what we want it to be. We want it to be something easy, but it's hard. It's hard to know this because the world, the flesh, and the devil do not want us to believe this. And they're going to do all they can to get us to believe lies. And so like the waves crashing on the shore, one lie after another comes crashing down upon us. And the question is, what are we going to do when those lies come? Are we just going to lay down on the beach and say it's too hard? And the waves are just going to crash over us and drown us. Or by God's grace, will we take up his armor and say, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight not in order to win the battle because Christ has already won the battle. But we're going to have to fight to know this. It's not something we can coast into. So that's what we need to know about knowing. That it's something that we want to transform us by God's grace. It's something that we have by faith and it's something for which we will have to fight. Now, what is it that we know? He says, and we know that, and how the ESV has it is sort of like a sandwich. There's the the meat of the promise in the middle and then the two pieces of bread on the outside. The, The inside is the content of the promise, the outside, 
are the conditions. What do I mean? Well, if you look at it, it says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So what's the actual promise? It's that all things work together for good. But then he places these two conditions on them, on this promise. For whom does all things work together for good? For those who love God on the one side, what's the other side that's keeping sandwiched together? For those who are called according to his purpose. So we have the meat and then the bread. The meat is all things work together for good. The bread is for those who are called according to his purpose and for those who love God. So our focus is going to be all things work together for good, but we can't miss the fact that this promise is only for those who love God and for those whom God has called. It's not true that all things work together for the good of all people. Apart from Christ, things do not work together for your good. So if you're here today and you don't know Christ, you don't love love God, you haven't yet acknowledged that you're a great sinner, but Jesus is a great savior, then these things are not for you. Apart from Christ, we cannot know that all things are going to work out for our good. In fact, what we should know is that apart from Christ, things will not be good because the ultimate destiny is for us to be in hell forever and ever. You know, we see, I see these signs everywhere related to COVID about things like, we'll we'll make it through this stronger than ever, or different things like that, that have these like, this confidence, we're gonna make it through this. But apart, apart from Christ, that's just all wishful thinking. We can't have any hope. We can't have any confidence that things will be good for us. But with Christ, we can. So let's look at this now. All things work together for good. All things means what? All things. Meaning not just the things we view as good, but also the things we view as bad or inconvenient, or evil, or painful, or not according to our plans. Those things also, Paul is saying, work together for good. And just so we don't doubt that, if you, um, the verses we read in, in chapter 8, verse 35, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? These are the things, these are the types of things that Paul is thinking about when he writes all things. Famine, nakedness, sleeplessness, a sword coming after you. And we could add to that what? Chronic pain. Um, relational conflicts, financial difficulties, all these unknowns that are going on in our life, children who are sick, yourself who is sick, family members who have died, all of these things and more are what Paul is thinking about when he writes all things. All things do what? They work together. And this... This imagery of being worked together, the, one of the pictures is that of weaving different things together to accomplish this specific end. So for those of you who uh, knit or crochet, I was thinking about with my great grandma, she would buy these kits um, where you get all of these, all of this different... Um, not yarn, what's the thread, all of this different thread, and then they give you this uh, little plastic, square plastic thing with all of these different holes in it, and then you got this instruction manual that tells you where to put each string in in the particular hole. Some of you know what I'm talking about. So you know what it's going to look like, but what do you have to do? You have to weave all of those different threads together to get it to look like the picture. Now what about if you only had one color thread? Would you get the picture? No, because it would just be this big blob. Like I painted when I was in kindergarten, 
just a, a blob of black, and I got in the art show for it. <laughs> I think just for, the teacher just kind of wanted to um, play a joke on my mom, so she put this thing in the um, art show. But if that were to be, if that were all the all the yarn we had, or all the thread was just one color, it would just be a big blob. What has to happen is all of these different colors need to be woven together in order for us to see the image. That's what Paul's saying is happening here with us. In our lives, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, every thread in our life, every experience that we go through is being woven together toward a specific end. And those threads of our life include not just the brilliant, bright colors that we love, but also the darkest, most dreadful black. All of those things are being woven together, are being worked together for our good. How does that weaving take place? Is it's not, as we often hear in the culture, it's not fate, it's not karma, it's not the stars being aligned, but it's that there is a personal sovereign God who is at work in all things, who is working all things together for our good. In all that happens in our life, God is at work. We may not see him working, we may not feel him working, but he is at work. He is taking every thread in our life, the good things and the bad things, and weaving those things together toward a specific end. And what is that end? It's for good or for our good. Now, if we were often what can happen in um, Bible studies is we read a verse and then we can ask this question, what does that mean? To you. So if we were to ask in the culture, what does it mean to you that all things work together for good? Probably what we would hear are things like, well, it means that no matter what happens, I know that in the end, I'm going to be I'm going to be healthy again. I'm going to be wealthy. I'm going to be prosperous. I'm going to be happy. But we don't want to know what this verse means to us. We want to know what does this verse mean? And the way we know what good God is working in all things is by looking at verse 29 and we'll read 30 as well so well let's start in 28 he says and we know that for those who love God all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So notice in those verses, there's nothing about us being healthy, wealthy, prosperous, and happy. What's described in those verses and the good toward which God is working all things is to conform us into the image of his son and to welcome us into his presence. In other words, it's to make us like Jesus and to lead us to glory, to to lead us to fellowship with God forever and ever. That's what God is doing in all things. So God working all things together for our good does not mean that we will get better. It does not mean that our financial difficulties will go away. It doesn't mean that we'll no longer have these relational conflicts. What does it mean? It means that God is going to take every single thing in our life to form and shape us into the image of Jesus, to make us more and more like Christ, and ultimately to take us to be with himself forever in heaven. That's what God's doing. And we need to realize that that is better than any earthly thing we could have. It is far better that everything in this life be taken from us and we be like Christ rather than us have everything in this world and have no knowledge of who Jesus is. Because conformity to Christ, holiness, is what will lead us to be with God forever and ever. 
So, and we know. We, we are longing for this knowledge to transform us. We have this knowledge by faith, and we're fighting to know it more and more. And what do we know? We know that for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, all things work together for good. Everything in our life, God is weaving together to make us more and more like Jesus. And notice how radically this can change the way we view the past, the way we view the present, and the way we view the future. If we think about the past, we can think about things that were done to us or things that we did. Things that were done to us can fill us with anger or hopelessness. Things that we did can fill us with this just unbearable guilt. What do we need to know? Well, for those things that were done to us, we need to realize that in Christ, we are more than conquerors. Because anything that people did to us in order to harm us, what will God ultimately do? He'll use it for good. He'll work it for good. He'll use, us to, use it to make us more like Christ. And the great Old Testament example of this is Joseph. If you read the end of Genesis, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. He went down into Egypt. Things began to look a little better for him. And then this woman lied about him. And so he was thrown into prison. And there he was forgotten for years and years and years. All of these horrible things were done to Joseph. Betrayal, abuse. People abandoned him. And yet in the end, what did he come to see? Though all of these people meant these things for evil, meant these things to destroy him, God meant it for good. And those people could not destroy Joseph because God took all that they were trying to do to destroy him to use it for good. And it's the same in our life. No matter how horrendous of a thing people did to us, we are more than conquerors. Things that we ourselves did, and perhaps we've experienced discipline as a result of it. Even the discipline that God does to us is for our good. As a parent disciplines, as parents discipline their children for the good of their children, so God always and only disciplines us for our good. How about in the present, when we have things that are painful or inconvenient, how should we see them? We should see all of those things as working for our good. And I try to remind myself of this when I wake up in, in the middle of the night with Ezra. And all I can think about is what? I want to get back to bed. <laughs> and the same thing, Savannah wakes up. And what is she thinking about? I just want to get back to bed. But what, how can we change the way we're seeing that? <laughs> we, can, we can give thanks that what? Thank you, God, that you are using this for good. And so when we're reminded of those things, when, when you get up and it's just ah, groaning because of all the pain, or you just have this horrible angst because of these, these things that are going on in your life. What do we need to do by God's grace? Is to give thanks to God saying, thank you, Father, that you are working this for my good, that there is no wasted thread in my life, that though I can't see and I can't feel how any good could come of this, I know that you're using it for good. I know you're using this to make me like Christ. I know that you will receive me to glory. Help me to hope in you. And the last thing with the future, where there are so many unknowns, so many uncertainties, so many things that can just fill us with anxiety and fear, we need to remember that no matter what happens in our life, it cannot separate us from God's love, and it will ultimately be used by God to make us like his son. And when we see that, when we truly know it, then this fear that we have won't be there. Why? Because what we fear is that something we love will be taken from us. But what this verse shows is that nothing can be taken from us that truly matters. Because no matter what happens, we will still belong to God and he will use what is happening for our good. 
So if if you're here today and you and you know Christ, you've trusted in him, then may this verse be an encouragement to you. May the Lord help us all to truly know these things, to fight to know them. When we wake up in the morning and we just begin ruminating upon all that is horrible in our life, may by God's grace, we discipline ourselves to think about this. May we take up the armor of God and fight. We have to learn to comma but our thoughts. We so often just have these thoughts that come in our mind and we just keep mulling over them and mulling over them, but we have to begin to comma but them. Why in the world is this happening? I don't understand, comma, but I know all things work together for my good. Why won't this pain ever go away? It just seems all hopeless, comma, but God's going to work it for good. But again, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, realize that these promises are not for you, but may seeing how wonderful the Lord is, how wonderful Christ is, draw you to him and, and lead you to trust in him. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us this promise as your children. We acknowledge that we are weak, that we are broken, that we so often lose sight of what you've told us in your word. Please give us the grace that we need to truly know it, enlightening the eyes of our hearts by your spirit so that we might know, that we might trust you, that we might fight to know these things. And so trust you and glorify you. That is our desire is for you to be exalted. So we thank you that you use all things to make us like Christ, which so honors you, so pleases you. And we long for the day when we will see you face to face. Whom have we in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that we desire besides you. Our flesh and our heart may fail, but you are the strength of our heart and our portion forever. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.